Welcome everybody to another chapter of the IFIMAC plus ICMM joint seminar series on condensed matter. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce our next invited speaker, Marcus Mueller, who is going to talk about topological quantum error correction from theoretical concepts to experiments. Let me tell you that since 2019, Marcus is a professor in theoretical quantum technology at the Institute for Quantum Information in RWTH Aachen University and at Forschungszentrum Jülich, Germany. Before that, he's had several appointments in the Department of Physics of Swansea University in UK. And before, we had the privilege to have him in Spain as a postdoctoral researcher in the Universidad Complutense de, Mar de Madrid, where he has collaborated, for instance, with Miguel Ángel Martín Delgado. He's devoted to theoretical quantum physics in the fields of scalable quantum information processing and quantum simulation of many body uh, physics, with a focus on implementations in atomic, molecular, and optical systems. Over the last years, the main focus of his research has been on topological quantum error correction, and fault-tolerant quantum computing, and practical realizations of these concepts in collaborations with leading experimental and theoretical groups in the field. Even though he's very young, he's already had an impressive career with several high-impact papers in nature and science, and in 2018, he was recognized with an ERC starting grant for the exploration of open quantum neural networks from fundamental concepts to implementations with atoms and photons. Before giving the floor to Marcos, let me remind you that you can make questions during the talk and also at the end of the talk by writing them in the chat or by raising your, uh, your hand. Your microphone will be muted by defect, but we will unmute it if you raise your hand. So please, Marcos, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Elsa, for the very kind introduction and for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to uh, speak in this uh, seminar series, although the pleasure would be even bigger to do this in person in Madrid, of course. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, yeah, I would like to tell you a little bit about topological quantum error correction and uh, introduce theoretical concepts and also some uh, recent experiments and um, progress in this direction. However, before doing this, um, let me uh, tell you that I'm, uh, let's say, a part of a larger environment in Aachen and in Jülich, where we are developing a scalable quantum information processing in a, a variety of areas um, in theory and in experiment, um, where quantum error correction is one aspect. Um, however, we're also looking into open quantum systems and uh, whereas my group is working on uh, atomic systems, mostly uh, the main focus and Aachen and Jülich is uh, also on superconducting uh, architectures here uh, with some of the colleagues uh, at our institute uh, shown here. Uh, if you don't know where Aachen is, that's at the kind of uh, three critical point between these uh, three countries, yeah, uh, where we have these uh, specialities, which I imagine is not uh, that impressive uh, uh, given the tapas in Madrid, but, but anyway. Um, okay, this brings me to the outline uh, of my talk. I, um, I would like to uh, start with a basic uh, introduction to quantum computing, as not everybody of you might be uh, from that field, uh, and also introduce um, in, in some steps uh, some basic concepts of uh, quantum error correction and uh, topological error correction codes. And then in the second part, I would like to uh, speak about how we can use these codes in order to uh, correct, uh, detect and correct uh, errors, in particular, uh, a specific error source that is uh, known as qubit loss or leakage, um, where I will be in introducing some theory work that we've been doing in my group, uh, and also uh, results from a recent experiment in which, uh, in collabor collaboration with our experimental colleagues, we demonstrated how we can correct uh, qubit loss in uh, such um, practical quantum information processes. And then the final part, then, uh, depending on the time I still have, I would like to outline uh, a little bit the a vision or you know uh, the route uh, towards then a scalable operation of uh, robust uh, logical qubits and uh, eventually uh, four torrent scalable quantum computers. Uh, as Elsa said, I'm I'm happy to uh, answer any questions, and uh, I I hope that uh, it's not uh, let's say too heavy from the uh, um, theory or or the technical point of view. But if something's unclear, please interrupt me. <laughs> 
Okay, uh, let's get started. Well, why uh, should we build quantum computers? Just a very brief uh, motivation. So a quantum computer is a, um, a quantum computer uh, is a machine that works based on the laws of quantum physics. It cannot calculate more things than we can do on a classical computer, but some uh, uh, substantially faster. And this is what is known as quantum speed up. And um, the field perhaps started off with the discovery of a Shor's factoring algorithm, which uh, if we have large quantum computers allows us to uh, decompose large numbers into their prime factors in polynomial time, whereas the best classical algorithms uh, known uh, can achieve this only in exponential time in the size of the numbers. And there's a uh, Grover's uh, search algorithm that uh, uh, allows us to speed up essentially all problems where we don't have better strategies than just brute force search. And um, perhaps from a most uh, relevant um, practical point of view, um, the application of quantum simulation, where we can uh, use quantum computers in order to simulate uh, ground states or also time dynamic, time uh, evolution of complex many body systems, which are notoriously hard to be simulated on classical uh, devices. And this has a number of um, potential applications in a variety of fields, uh, ranging from quantum chemistry and material science uh, to high energy physics, but also optimization of practically uh, relevant problems, uh, for instance, in uh, logistics or scheduling and, and uh, real life um, problems. Okay, so what is a quantum computer? Let's say at a, at a little bit abstract uh, uh, scale. Um, imagine that we have a register of qubits that we can prepare in a simple initial state here. Uh, and then what a quantum computer computation is, is essentially an engineered a quantum evolution, a unitary evolution that takes place on this uh, multi-qubit register. And where at the end, we receive uh, a final state that we can then measure. Uh, and from that extract classical information that hopefully gives us uh, information about the uh, solution to a problem that we want to solve on the quantum computer. And there are essentially two in ingredients. Uh, one is uh, quantum parallelism. That um, means that if we, for instance, come in with a superposition of initial states um, due to the um, uh, linearity of quantum mechanics, this means that the quantum computation essentially converts these states or evolves this state into a superposition of all final states. Uh, however, this is only part of the truth because what we also need is a quantum interference uh, in order to kind of uh, have an output state where, where we uh, find the result of the computation uh, with a high probability. Otherwise, we would just uh, collapse onto one of the solutions and not have uh, a quantum uh, advantage or quantum speed up. Okay, if we then uh, think about a more practical quantum computer, um, if somebody wants us to run a quantum computation, what we have to do is to decompose this into basic operations. And these are known as a single or two qubit or even multi qubit uh, gate operations of which you see here an example where we have uh, gates acting here on qubits uh, represented by these wires that uh, are single qubit unitary operations and then also uh, two qubit gates such as for instance a C naught gate between uh, a pair of qubits that allows us to create entanglement between different qubits. Uh, these are the um, single qubit quantum gates that we'll be seeing um, in, in the context of error correction here essentially the Pauli Z and Pauli X uh, matrices or Pauli X gates. And if we have a sufficiently uh, large set of gate operations, the so-called universal gate set from which we can build arbitrary uh, quantum computations, then we have an architecture in which we can in principle run any algorithm that we want. Okay, what is the problem? Why can we not yet buy quantum computers? Yeah, well, the main obstacle are uh, is decoherence and errors. And what I've, uh, uh, shown here is an example, uh, a cartoon of a trapped ion quantum computer. I come back to that in more detail later on, where we see that if we store, for instance, quantum uh, information in forms of qubits in uh, electronic states, and we have a coupling to the environment, um, that can induce, for instance, magnetic field fluctuations that uh, lead to dephasing uh, of our qubits. And that means that if we start with an initial uh, coherence position state, after a certain time, uh, due to these random fluctuations, the phase information in that state is lost and we are, for instance, here left with a classical mixture. And this is uh, something that we can now describe by uh, quantum channels. Uh, and, and what we in particular are interested in are uh, computational errors, where we can have the dephasing that would be described by phase flip errors, 
But we can also have, for instance, flip of uh, electronic uh, population or qubit population between the states that would be uh, corresponding to bit flips, such as we know them from classical uh, information. And then the other error source I come back to later uh, is uh, that we can not only have errors here within this computational uh, subspace, but we can also have qubits escaping our quantum register uh, or being stuck in other uh, states outside of this two state uh, computational uh, manifold. And um, yeah, how can we deal with such errors? Well, that is um, by means of quantum error correction. And the idea is uh, such as we know it from classical uh, error correction to use redundancy. That means uh, storing information, not in single uh, quantities in this case qubits, but to protect them by copying information. However, in the classical case where we can just do um, um, copies and then do a comparison, uh, between various uh, copies and the redundant information to find out what has happened on our information register. In the quantum case, it's more complicated because we cannot directly copy quantum states. Yeah? That is known as the no cloning uh, theorem for quantum states. So that, that states there is no uh, physical procedure that if we are given an arbitrary state psi, we can produce two copies of that state and, uh, and thereby this uh, naive way uh, is uh, of, of uh, protecting information is not possible. However, what people have come up with are quantum error correction codes. And let me here start with the basic, most basic example, namely the three qubit repetition code, which is a direct generalization of the three bit repetition code uh, in classical information. So the idea is to store information now not in a single physical qubit, but here in a register of three physical qubits, such as such that if we then have a an arbitrary uh, encoded state that would now be a, a generally uh, an entangled state uh, of three qubits yeah, in, a, in this um, uh, entangled uh, superposition state. And now the idea is that um, we can also look at this now from a little bit more mathematical point of view uh, and consider these uh, two states in the larger Hilbert space of all physical qubits as a so-called code space in which we want to store information, a subspace of the larger Hilbert space. And the idea is that ideally we want to be in this subspace spanned by these uh, two states here. And this is what we can ensure by looking at correlations. For instance, here the correlation between the first and the second qubit uh, would be captured by such a two qubit stabilizer operator uh, formed of the two Pauli Z operators indicating that what we want is that the first and second qubit are parallelly ori oriented. And similarly for the uh, second and the third qubit. If, however, now uh, one of our physical qubits suffers an error, for instance, a bit flip, say on the first qubit, this uh, is a physical process, uncontrolled, that takes us out of this uh, two-dimensional subspace and excites it, if you like, into an orthogonal subspace. And then the idea is, that we can detect uh, such an event by measuring these correlation operators. Yeah, by measuring the parity of this, in this case, these two qubit uh, stabilizers, where we would, for instance, here see now a signal where we have uh, odd parity between the first and the second, and even parity between the second and the third. And we could now use this information to infer that most likely an error has happened on the first qubit and thereby apply a correction uh, in order to bring our system back to the original uh, encoded state. What we also have, besides these um, parity operators, so-called stabilizers that stabilize the state in this uh, two-dimensional uh, subspace, we have logical operators that um, operate within this uh, code space. And what they do is they define a logical qubit of, uh, let's say, a logical uh, zero and a logical one state. Uh, and uh, for instance, the logical x operator, which in this case would be given just by the Pauli x on all three qubits would now be flipping this logical state. And similarly, a Z logical operator would imprint a relative minus sign onto the two uh, basis states. Okay, this is a very um, limited code of only three qubits. And let me now give you an idea, but where we see that we can formulate more complicated codes such as topological error correcting codes uh, also within this uh, formalism. So what is on a qualitative level, the idea of a uh, topological uh, error correcting code? Well, topology is a feature of a, of a large uh, many body system, let's say, um, that uh, is, is a global feature, which is invariant under local uh, changes or continuous perturbations. So 
on a pictorial level, what you see is what this cup and this donut have in common is that they have a single hole in the middle and we can continuously deform one structure into the other. And then now in the context of error correction, the idea is that we want to store information now in a many body system. And the assumption is, or the, the hope is that as long as uh, noise processes and errors happen locally on, on the system, that we can, that those are not able to destroy these global properties and we can recover uh, from uh, such errors. So the, the information or the idea is that as long as errors happen uh, on a small part of the system, but not on uh, some um, extensive uh, support of uh, physical qubits, we can uh, correct uh, this information. Okay, let me uh, then introduce the, um, let's say the most commonly known uh, topological uh, quantum error correcting code, uh, Kitaev's uh, TORIC code. Uh, it's not the only code and I will come back to other examples uh, later on. But let's imagine that we have a two dimensional um, register of qubits where qubits are placed on the edges of a uh, 2D square lattice. And now what we introduce are similar parity check operators as we've seen for the three qubit code. However, here now, because we have this 2D architecture, we have now plaquette operators in which we uh, define parity check operators formed of four qubits belonging here to uh, one plaquette and then similarly uh, throughout the entire uh, lattice. And as for the three qubit code, these can be used and to detect, for instance, bit flip errors that happen uh, on any of the physical qubits on our lattice. In the quantum case, we also have to deal with phase flip errors. And that is being done by uh, introducing so-called X-type uh, uh, stabilizer operators, which uh, for the surface code now act here on vertices of this uh, 2D square lattice. And um, what you can uh, easily realize is that uh, all these uh, stabilizer operators mutually commute. They have eigenvalues plus and minus one, and they commute because they either share no qubit as is shown here, or if they have qubits in common, that is uh, always two qubits, like uh, for instance, of this plaquette operator and this adjacent uh, vertex operator. That means we can think of the code space in which we want to uh, store logical information as the common uh, plus one eigenspace of all these stabilizer operators on the entire lattice, or equivalently, if we write down a Hamiltonian that is uh, a frustration-free sum of all these uh, stabilizer operators, that would correspond to the ground state of this Hamiltonian in which we want to store uh, the logical uh, quantum information. Okay, how can we now define logical qubits? And this is done uh, similar to the logical qubit operators we've seen for the three qubit code here by uh, so-called string operators that wind around uh, the, the torus. So we have this 2D lattice embedded with periodic boundary conditions on the torus and a logical uh, Z operator corresponding to one encoded logical qubit would now correspond to a string of Pauli uh, Z operators um, winding uh, through the entire lattice structure. Similarly, we can uh, introduce a logical, a logical X operator here, for instance, that would now act on this string of uh, physical qubits with a, with, with a sequence of uh, Pauli uh, X operations. And what we uh, see is that these logical operators, they commute with the, with the stabilizer operators that we've introduced uh, as before. Um, that means they leave the code space in which we store information invariant, but what they do is they can now change the logical state, uh, for instance, from logical zero to logical one by applying uh, this string operator on the lattice. So how do we now uh, correct for errors? Let me give you a cartoon version of how this works. If we are in the error-free subspace where we are in the common uh, plus one eigenspace of all stabilizers, um, that would correspond to one of the, for the Tory code, four possible degenerate uh, ground states. And if now a physical phase flip error, for instance, uh, uh, happens on one of the, the qubits here, this, or sorry, this should be actually, yeah, here, a bit flip error. But anyway, uh, what it does is it, uh, it anti-commutes with two of the adjacent stabilizer operators and leads to so-called quasi-particle excitations. So these are nothing but minus one eigenstates of the corresponding stabilizer operators. In the Hamiltonian language, you can now think of these as being excited states. And if more errors happen, these uh, excitations can kind of diffuse uh, through your system. We have 
in the Tory code two types of excitations uh, because we can have excitations of plaquettes as well as of uh, vertex operators. And the property of these excitations is that they uh, actually correspond to a billion anions, uh, meaning that if we wind them uh, uh, around each other, we would uh, pick up um, a phase of, of minus one. However, in the context of error correction, um, we, we are not interested in these excitations. Yeah, they are not uh, sufficiently rich uh, in, the, in the sense of the, uh, the exchange statistics to do a universal set of gate operations with these. But we always want to kind of remain in this ground state and do our logical gate operations there. So what do we have to do in quantum error correction? Well, essentially play, uh, so to say, the, the game uh, whack a mole yeah? Imagine that we have this lattice where there are no uh, errors initially. And uh, what now errors do is they create these excitations and what we have to do, or our experimental colleagues, uh, they have to detect the occurrence of such excitations that occur randomly and can diffuse over the lattice. And if we are able to detect uh, these errors uh, quickly enough, uh, then we can keep them kind of localized before they move over to far distances and uh, remove them from the lattice in order to bring the system back to the ground state without changing the logical information. So let me give you one example. Imagine that we have a uh, historic uh, code ground state, and we now see by measuring these uh, stabilizer operators in the lattice, a pair of excitations. If we see these two excitations, now we have to make a guess on which of the physical qubits errors have happened. And in this case, where we would um, um, guess that the error has happened here on this uh, qubit between these two excited plaquette operators and thereby then apply a recovery operation, just the corresponding, say, X uh, bit flip uh, on, on this uh, qubit on this link here. And in this case, what you see is if this was the actual error and we apply this correction, we undo um, the occurrence of this error, sigma X squares to the identity. And no matter what our initial logical state was, we get back to the same logical state. So that would be as an example of where quantum error correction works. Imagine, however, that we see a situation like that, where uh, we see these two excited plaquettes. And now we have to guess, and we would probably say it, the error was on these two qubits, but with only a very um, or a slightly lower probability, we could also have had here errors on this qubit, uh, this and this qubit. And then you see in this situation, the two errors and uh, or the, the three errors here, and our uh, guess for what the, the correction that we should apply, now together they correspond to a string operator that winds around the torus. And that means we bring the system back to the ground state, however, without noticing, we apply a logical uh, string operator that changes our encoded uh, information. And that is an example now where you see that uh, the, the error correction uh, has failed. Now we can ask, how well um, do we have to play this game? Yeah, so how many errors can occur uh, as a per round, let's say, um, so that we have a chance in order to um, make the correct guess. And this uh, is uh, something people have studied by a number of uh, techniques. And if we have only um, this bit and phase flip errors, one can tolerate uh, about 10% uh, of, uh, of the physical qubits suffering uh, such an error and still bring the system back with a probability uh, to the, uh, and the correct uh, encoded state uh, close to one. If we want to be more realistic, uh, we have to take into account that we cannot measure these stabilizer operators perfectly. If one takes this into account in a phenomenological way, what one sees is that this um, tolerable threshold now shrinks and goes down to a few percent, um, for 3% for the Tory code. And if we want to model the system even more realistically, uh, then we have to write down the quantum gates that our experimental colleagues use in order to measure such a four qubit uh, stabilizer operator. And how they do this, I come back to uh, experimental examples later, uh, is that they couple this to ancillary qubits uh, with a sequence of two qubit gates, for instance, in order to measure this parity. And if one then models the imperfections in the actual quantum gates here, um, in state preparation, single and two qubit gates, as well as measurements, then this threshold uh, um, is even smaller, not unexpectedly, but still on the order of about 1%. And the key take home message is that these are error rates that uh, are within reach of what uh, experimental uh, architectures have demonstrated to date. And that means that these topological codes 
are uh, essentially one of the leading candidates in order to realize practical quantum error correction for um, um, fidelities or accuracy of quantum gates uh, that are uh, have been demonstrated uh, already to date. However, if we go to an experimental list with this kind of figure um, with, the, with the qubits on a torus, they will send us away and uh, tell us, hey, come back in 10 years. <laughs> Perhaps then I have a, a quantum computer with, with qubits on a torus. Um, however, the good news is that uh, this is not needed. Um, we can uh, also work with so-called planar topological codes. And here the idea is that we, we don't embed this with periodic boundary conditions, but one can have a truly planar um, uh, code. So where, again, we have here a bulk uh, that has the same square lattice structure. But the idea is that one can now uh, play with the boundary conditions here, uh, namely uh, engineering the, the lattice uh, boundaries in such a way that one has, for instance, here a so-called rough boundary where, these, where one has these open plaquettes and here a smooth boundary. Um, and the idea is that then now, uh, instead of he, having your logical operators winding around the torus, one has now logical operators that uh, have to uh, a start and end, for instance, on a smooth boundary or the corresponding uh, complementary operator that goes from one uh, rough uh, to another rough boundary. And what you see is that uh, this is how the topologies can be also encoded in these planar architectures and, um, and where, where these operators are not unique but have to uh, kind of go from one side uh, to the other. And uh, these architectures are then of course much more realistic and are what people are trying to build now uh, in order to implement this in, in a variety of 2D architectures that I will be showing a bit later on. Okay, so how have people actually obtained uh, these, these thresholds that I've been uh, talking about? Well, for these phenomenological noise models, um, what uh, people have been showing is that one can take topological quantum error correcting codes and map them uh, to classical uh, statistical uh, spin models with this order. And then essentially from the information uh, of phase transitions in the classical spin model, one can uh, then make statements and identify essentially uh, phases uh, in which in the quantum model error correction works and the disordered phase in the classical model would indicate uh, that in the quantum code, uh, quantum error correction uh, fails. And what I want to do now in the following is not talk about this, but tell you uh, another a new uh, connection to um, between quantum error correcting codes and classical statistical physics uh, that has to do with percolation. Uh, and that is uh, coming into play when we do not speak about these computational errors bit in phase flips, but about qubit loss. So let me um, then um, yeah, come to that uh, next part in which I would like to introduce uh, uh, what a qubit loss is and how we can deal with it in theory and in experiment. So qubit loss comes in a variety of incarnations depending on your physical architecture. If you think for instance of um, qubits encoded in cold atoms and optical lattices, you can really have an atom being lost from the lattice uh, due to recoil event for instance, and then this qubit is truly um, no longer there. Uh, however, in archi other architectures, such as uh, trapped ions or uh, solid state architectures, qubits are not physically lost, but they can, for instance, um, be uh, stuck or, or decay into other uh, electronic states, for instance, yeah, that are would be outside of our two qubit, uh, two layer, uh, two level um, qubit subspace in which we want to store uh, information. And that means that the, the, the qubit can still be sitting there. However, uh, it's not no longer taking part in the quantum computation and that, that if we overlook such a process that uh, can have fatal consequences on quantum error correction or what, what, what we think that our algorithm actually does. And um, yeah, let me give you an idea of how we can deal with qubit loss in topological codes. And the basic idea is what we have seen is that logical information is uh, essentially encoded in this string operators that have to go through the lattice. And one thing that is uh, nice about the topological codes is that it only depends on the topology, but not on the exact support of these string operators. So imagine that we have a qubit loss here on this second qubit. What we can essentially do is just uh, look for an alternative logical operator that evades this position where, where the qubit has been lost and just takes a slightly different path. Yeah? We can deform these string operators 
uh, as long as we do not change, uh, say, their, their overall uh, topology that they wind, for instance, around the torus or go from one boundary uh, to the other. And what that um, means or what that shows is that we can um, uh, protect our logical quantum information in the surface code, as has been shown in these uh, works, uh, as long as we find such a logical operator that evades the position of losses. And that then essentially gives you already an idea of uh, what, what it has to do with percolation. Each physical qubit sits on a link of the lattice. That means if such a physical qubit has been lost, that is a link that is no longer available for the logical operator to have support on and uh, percolate through the lattice. And then what we see is that um, the existence of such a percolation path is directly related to the possibility to recover the logical information. As soon as the lattice uh, does no longer percolate, we cannot recover information. And for the square lattice, this bond percolation um, threshold is of course known for a long time. And it's, 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 it's exactly at uh, one half uh, of, the, of the bonds. Yeah? So if 50% uh, of the bonds are randomly chosen and kicked out from the lattice, uh, then the lattice and the thermodynamics limit uh, stops to percolate. And that is when we are no longer able to recover uh, logical uh, information. Let me uh, then tell you a, a little bit of a more interesting uh, story uh, of uh, a new type of percolation problem. If uh, one asks of how we can now uh, deal with qubit loss in other classes of topological codes. And what you see here uh, is a cartoon of a related uh, topological code, a so-called color code that was uh, pioneered in the group of um, Miguel Martin El Degado. Uh, in Madrid, and uh, where you again have physical qubits that now sit on sides of the lattice. And we again have stabilizer operators of Z type and X type in order to detect bit and phase flip errors. However, now these stabilizers are uh, uniquely or only defined on plaquettes of the lattice um, uh, rather than, than the, the vertex operators that we've been uh, seeing uh, before. And now the problem that we uh, addressed in, in this work is uh, to understand of how we can deal with qubit loss at all. And then what we wanted to understand is how many uh, qubits uh, can actually be lost from the lattice in order to be able to recover the encoded logical information. So let me give you an idea of the, the problem or why it's uh, actually interesting. Imagine that one of the physical qubits is, uh, is being lost from the lattice and now what you would the first thing you'd be left with is to uh, find essentially a scheme of how you can recover again a three colorable lattice that is able to host uh, this uh, 2D color code. So what we have um, is the requirement that adjacent plaquettes need to be of different uh, color. That is uh, one of the constructions that underlie these topological uh, uh, color codes. Uh, that means we have to preserve this three colorability of the, of the code. And um, yeah, in this case, we, we cannot um, simply kind of merge two plaquettes or three plaquettes because then this color would be undefined. So the recipe that we proposed was let's let's do something that is uh, sounds a bit brutal. Yeah, we, if there's a loss on a, uh, on a physical qubit, let us kick out uh, by hand a neighboring uh, qubit, a uh, so-called twin, twin qubit. And what we can then do is remove the links that were connecting uh, with, this, with these two qubits, the one that, that was lost and the one that we were kicking out, and then merge two of the previous plaquettes here, these two green plaquettes, into a larger plaquette. And then we would have also here these uh, slightly smaller uh, uh, shrinking plaquettes, uh, A and B, that would now have, instead of support on six qubits, for instance, only on two qubits. And what you see already with your eye is that this is now an irregular, but again, a valid uh, three colorable lattice, meaning that that encodes the same number uh, of logical uh, qubits. Now, how uh, can we now uh, think about these percolation properties to, in order to answer how many of these losses can occur, uh, in particular because we also sacrifice qubits in addition, that, that seems to be quite uh, daunting. And um, in color codes, we have also string operators that would be corresponding to a product of Pauli operators going uh, through the lattice. And again, these operators can be deformed in order to avoid the position of a loss. However, the um, dynamics is more interesting because in color codes, one can also have uh, what is known as string branching. So um, what can happen is 
that if one starts out, for instance, with such a logical operator that uh, acts or goes here through uh, these blue plaquettes, this operator can split up into a combination at a certain point here of a red uh, string operator and a green string operator that at some later time then emerge again. And then you see you, you, um, you get more interesting or more complex uh, uh, um, string um, structures, so to say, instead of only having strings, one can have these so-called uh, string nets as well. And what this uh, now shows is in a pictorial way that if we, for instance, have a red logical operator here and we have qubit losses on the lattice, it can happen that the logical operator doesn't find a way through lattice anymore. However, it can split up and kind of take a bit of a path along a green uh, string and the blue string uh, before it then reunites at some certain point here and continues its, its journey as a, as a red operator. What you then see is that this is a new type of percolation problem where we have essentially three coupled uh, lattices and that was, uh, let's say, motivated from these topological codes but has not been uh, studied uh, before. What we then um, uh, answered by, uh, by both analytically uh, and, and also by numerics is the question of how many uh, qubit losses we can tolerate. Let me just give you, uh, guide you a little bit here through these uh, results. So what you see here is on, on the x-axis, the lattice size and the infinite limit is on the left here, one over the, over the distance of the code. And what you see is if we just look at the normal percolation of say a red uh, lattice, uh, a red string operator, we can tolerate up to 20% uh, of the, of the uh, uh, physical qubits being lost. If we now allow that such a red operator branches out into the other two lattices, we see that, we, that the threshold goes up to about 40%, it doubles. And if we now uh, look at kind of all possible uh, string nets, uh, where, where even this string net can further branch out and the green, for instance, become temporarily red and blue, uh, that leads here to uh, this uh, maximum upper threshold of 46% uh, of the uh, qubits. And that is, uh, first of all, a very high value. It's almost uh, saturating the uh, fundamental limit, which is given by the no cloning th theorem corresponding to 50%. And it, uh, it, uh, it, it shows uh, that also in topological uh, color codes, uh, qubit loss can be uh, corrected uh, up to very high uh, values of, of loss rates. Okay, let me then, uh, this was sort of a theory and uh, nice cartoons with string nets. Uh, let me now give you an idea of how one would do this uh, in practice, uh, detecting a loss and correcting it. And that's a protocol that we uh, proposed and then worked out with our experimental colleagues uh, in, in the University of Innsbruck that have a trapped iron quantum computer that you see here on this photo uh, that looks complicated, a lot of uh, optical devices, lasers, uh, electronic control, but where the heart of the quantum computer is really in this uh, zone here where you see a vacuum chamber with windows, let me zoom in a little bit, um, and a linear uh, ion trap that is formed of a number of electrodes where um, static and oscillating electric fields can be applied in order to uh, store strings of uh, trapped ions. So let me uh, perhaps give you here a cartoon version of how such uh, a string then looks like. Yeah? Uh, due to the confinement and their mutual Coulomb repulsions, these uh, trapped ions of which you see here a fluorescence picture form these nice uh, kind of chains of ions uh, where they, if we laser cool them, they sit at, um, at controlled positions at a distance of a few micrometers between them. And in a trapped ion quantum computer, what we do is we can store uh, qubits in uh, electronics uh, metastable states here, for instance, an S and a D state and manipulate them uh, with lasers in order to induce gate operations. And the common vibrational modes of the ion chain can be used to mediate also two or multi-qubit uh, entangling gates between the ions. And then there are additional states, I don't want to go into these details, that can be used to prepare uh, initial states. For instance, they register initially in the zero state or also use a fluorescence uh, a light in order to measure the final state of a, of a quantum computation. So what we proposed is a scheme uh, where we uh, would wanted now to see of how one can detect and correct a qubit loss exactly as I explained here in a situation where a qubit has been lost and we have to kind of um, 
and deform the logical operators and recover the quantum information. Let me um, show you the, the smallest system that you can think of that is just a little excerpt of a uh, potentially larger uh, 2D surface code that is formed of four qubits. So here you essentially have only one vertex operator and uh, this very small um, um, plaquette operator is not even a full uh, four qubit plaquette. But nonetheless, this is uh, sufficient uh, um, to have a non-trivial uh, encoding and to uh, be able to see whether we can detect and correct a qubit loss. So what we did with our experimental colleagues is first to store an encoded logical state in these four qubits, and then we induced by hand in a controlled way a loss on, on one of the physical qubits that we now needed to uh, detect. Uh, so this ha can, can happen with a controllable probability. And what we used is or designed a, a detection scheme where we used an additional ancillary qubit in order to um, uh, realize a QND, quantum non-demolition uh, loss detection unit that allowed us essentially to interrogate this physical qubit without asking for its state, have you been lost? Are you still there? Then I leave you in peace. <laughs> or if you have been lost, then what the experimentalist did is feed forward this classical information in order to apply in sequence, that means during the quantum computation, a restoration operation where they recovered the encoded logical information initially from the four qubits now on the remaining uh, three qubits. And what you see here is, is the result of, uh, of how this worked. So where after the encoding uh, of a logical superposition state here of these four uh, physical qubits, a logical Y eigenstate, what you see is that all the stabilizers are, have positive values. We have a code space population close to one, meaning that we are in the subspace where we want to be. And the logical Y operator is also positive, meaning that we have indeed prepared this logical Y eigenstate. And then after the detection of the qubit loss, if it has taken place and the restoration operation, we see that now we have a smaller code, only of three qubits. That means we have only two stabilizers. They again are positive. We've been able to measure and restore them. And our uh, encoded logical state is also uh, preserved within uh, experimental error bars. But this is really the, the first um, uh, demonstration uh, experimentally of a deterministic, that means without post-selection, uh, detection and correction of, of a qubit loss. Okay, let me then in the remaining uh, five minutes or so give you an idea of uh, where we want to go. Yeah, we've seen this building block uh, of how we can deal with, uh, with qubit loss. Let me now give you uh, at least an idea of how we can scale up uh, um, um, architectures in order to operate now on fully functional uh, logical qubits and then eventually reach scalable uh, quantum processes. And a few years ago, we, we started to do this. That was actually um, one of the main works uh, during my postdoc uh, in, in Madrid, um, where we uh, developed a scheme where we uh, implemented the smallest uh, topological uh, code that consists of seven qubits. That's kind of the smallest color code in 2D. And we embedded this, uh, in, in this case, in a non-scalable way in a, in a 1D uh, ion string uh, formed of seven uh, trapped ion qubits. And what we at that time um, managed is to encode the logical state. So again, what you see here is uh, after the initial encoding, all stabilizers uh, on all of the plaquettes are positive. Ideally, they should be at one, but due to experimental imperfections, they are at lower values, but they all clearly pointing up. And we see that we've prepared the logical zero state. And now what we did at that time is to induce in a controlled way computational errors, such as a bit flip. And then we verified that we indeed saw the signature of these errors by, for instance, seeing now that we have this pair of excitations on neighboring plaquettes uh, showing or showing up as minus one uh, eigenvalues of the corresponding Z type um, plaquette operators here, whereas this green plaquette uh, is not affected because it's not, it doesn't have this qubit here uh, taking part, for instance. What we additionally did is uh, after the encoding also show that one can also not only protect information, but actually do quantum uh, computations on the, on the logical qubit by demonstrating here a sequence of uh, logically encoded um, Clifford operations. So in simple terms, what we did is we did not only prepare a logical zero state, but all the uh, six states in all six directions of the logical block sphere. Um, at that time, however, the quality of these operations was not good enough in order to protect information from, from real errors that happen on the system. 
And this is really the goal now in, our, in the field of quantum error correction to push the quality uh, of logical qubits to the point where we can protect information against uh, real errors and not uh, only, let's say, have proof of principle uh, um, um, demonstrations with injected noise. And this is something that I'm, I'm working on in a number of uh, projects with a number of theory and experimental uh, collaborators where um, the idea is that we want to go to scalable uh, trapped iron architectures. You will see something on that on the next slide. And where a lot of different um, capabilities uh, need to come together uh, on the theory side um, in, uh, protocols for, uh, for um, uh, feasible encoding quantum error correction uh, and, and gate operations on these logical qubits as well as uh, numerical simulations to assess the performance of these codes. And on the experimental side, well, uh, a number of uh, control uh, capabilities, uh, for instance, the uh, actual iron trap uh, control, um, optimal control in order to push the fidelities of gate operations to the level where they're good enough to be useful, uh, hardware control, uh, control electronics, and, and so on. So this is really, uh, I would say, an interdisciplinary uh, effort uh, in, in getting this uh, to work. So what is the vision? Well, the idea would be that instead of having this macroscopic uh, pole trap with a single uh, string, one can now work with so-called segmented traps. So here you see a photograph of such a, a segmented uh, trap, where the uh, basic idea is that one can now have controllable regions in which qubits can be stored, and they can also be, for instance, moved from one region into another. And um, one can even uh, then uh, rotate crystals in order to have a dynamical configurability of a, of a quantum register. And the idea is that, that one uh, has, for instance, here a register of data qubits that encode the, the qubits forming a logical qubit, and in addition, ancillary qubits that are being used, for instance, for the readout of the stabilizer information that we need in order to do quantum uh, error correction. And um, in, in work that has also been done with colleagues uh, here uh, in Madrid and with uh, Alejandro Bermudez and um, his PhD student, uh, Andrea, um, and uh, a colleague, uh, Farid, in, in the UK, we've been actually working on these protocols and also on uh, characterization techniques, uh, because that is uh, also an important aspect of not only having the protocol to uh, how the experimentalists do it, but in the end also have protocols that show that what they have done actually is, uh, for instance, fault tolerant or creates uh, quantum correlations. And what we um, proposed recently is a toolbox of techniques that is able to uh, uh, demonstrate uh, the correct functioning of such qubits, for instance, by an entanglement witnessing uh, technique. On the theory side, uh, what we uh, also did is to um, do accurate modeling of really the experimental uh, operations that our colleagues have in order to predict at which point uh, using a logical qubit becomes uh, useful. So what you see here is uh, essentially the storage time. Uh, and uh, what we see is that if we use um, a number of quantum error correction protocols, I don't want to go into the detail, uh, and, and the experimentalists achieve the um, um, goals for their fidelities that they, that they are aiming at over the next years, then we should be able really to uh, have logic qubits uh, that outperform, uh, for instance, in terms of storage time, the, the robustness that is offered by storing information instead in a single physical qubit or not doing quantum error correction uh, at all. Okay, if we have the segmented trap, then others uh, are working on, let's say, the vision of scaling these into larger trap arrays. So the idea is one can now couple several of these traps by our so-called junctions. And the idea is that then one can move qubits or ions here from one arm of a, of a trap into another arm and thereby build really two-dimensional larger registers in which we could then embed the surface codes or the color codes of increasing size in order to have a two-dimensional planar quantum computer with patches that encode logical qubits and that can be coupled, uh, for instance, as is kind of shown in a cartoon version here or there, in order to also to realize gate operations between these uh, logical qubits. That is one, one oops, that is one uh, version um, of how we want to, want, want, want to go. And let me perhaps show you um, a cartoon of how this could look like. This is uh, obviously an illustration only, where we uh, can now do gate operations and this ion crystal reconfigurations. And then 
perhaps um, over the next years, people are working on uh, making this a reality that one would have two dimensional coupled uh, trap arrays here. This is um, shown uh, from a proposal um, by the group of Vinnie Hensinger in the UK, in Sussex, where the idea would be that we have now a, an architecture in which we can move ions uh, around, um, for instance, to gate operations in a certain uh, area of the trap with either, uh, for instance, uh, um, um, microwave pulses or laser pulses, and then uh, move the ions, for instance, to another uh, region of the trap where they could be then read out and in parallel uh, in another region, um, states can be, be again prepared or you know, if a qubit loss has been detected, a fresh qubit is being brought in uh, and so on. So that one really operates on these architectures in a, in a 2D uh, scalable uh, fashion. I don't want to speak only about ions, just one quick word also about an alternative architecture. Um, uh, you probably have all heard about the quantum supremacy work by Google uh, one and a half years ago, and uh, where they had a 53 qubit uh, chip. And what I had there on my slide is that this would be actually an architecture that could host such a distance five uh, a surface code. And it was only uh, this at the beginning of this month uh, that uh, again, the Google team has actually shown that this uh, is possible. And what they did is now uh, for the first time, prepare a distance five uh, surface code. So exactly what I, what I showed to you with up to, in this case, uh, 31 uh, qubits, where they characterize the state by uh, um, yeah, extracting the entanglement entropy, uh, that, which demonstrates that this is a topologically ordered uh, uh, quantum state that they prepared. They also showed um, kind of a braiding of anionic uh, quasi particles, these plaquette excitations, if you like, via a Ramsey interferometry uh, technique, uh, showing that you, know, you have this uh, a billion anions. Uh, what they did not yet do is uh, active uh, error correction in the sense of uh, feed, feed forward of uh, measured information in order to actively uh, correct uh, errors. But this is clearly, you know, I would say an exciting uh, experiment that shows that uh, the progress that is being done on these architectures. Yeah, and there's an ongoing race. Yeah, I've spoken a bit about trapped ion quantum computers, uh, giving you a flavor of uh, superconducting qubits. There are other platforms such as uh, cold atoms and uh, Rydberg atoms uh, and other uh, solid state um, approaches um, that have reached a different level of, uh, let's say, experimental control to date and that are potential platforms that uh, people are trying to develop in order to push this to the regime where we can do um, uh, logical qubits uh, in the regime of beneficial quantum error correction and eventually large scale quantum computation. Who will win in the end? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> we, will, we will see. It's an open race, I would say. Um, but I hope that I could convince you that actually topological quantum computing is not only a beautiful theory concept yeah, with nice connections to, for instance, the statistical physics, but it's actually something real and that it's, uh, in my opinion, the most promising route uh, towards practical and useful falter and uh, quantum computing with fascinating experimental progress. And I think the best uh, is kind of still to come. With that, I would like to uh, thank uh, my group and uh, uh, my collaborators uh, that I've listed here of, of some of the works that I've been uh, showing, uh, the funding um, uh, agencies, and also you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marcus for this wonderful talk. I see several uh, applauses in the... <laughs> okay, so let's go to questions. I already see some raised hands. Uh, so this case is Pablo San Jose. I'm going to unmute him. Yes. Pablo, can you talk? Yes. Yes, you, you can hear me, yes? Yes. Okay, great. So thanks, uh, thanks, Marcus, very much for the talk. It's uh, it's very clear uh, in a very complicated topic, so it was very useful for me. Um, I have one question about this. Uh, well, actually, two, if uh, time allows, uh, about the um, error correction threshold mm -hmm. in, in the whack-a-mole kind of approach that you discussed uh, in the second part. You mentioned that a practical one percent failure rate. Would be could be corrected. I, I I'm not sure I understood right. Is this one percent of physical or logical qubits? 
Um, the one percent. Uh, let me go back to that. Um, is um, see. the one percent refers to a a noise model in which you assume that your um, basic gate operations that you use for error correction are faulty. Let me see. Uh, I find the slide here. Okay, here it is. Yeah, where we, where we model, let's say the experimental circuitry that we need, uh, you know, in terms of uh, C naught gates, single qubit gates, and, and the 1% uh, is based on the model where we say all of these operations, state preparation, single qubit gates, two qubit gates, they can be faulty. For simplicity, let's just assume that the error rate on all of them is the same so that we have a single noise parameter. And okay. what it means is that uh, if we have a large uh, enough lattice, then we can tolerate uh, infidelities of 1% in, in all these operations. Okay, in the operations. But if, yeah. if they are perfect uh, and you, you assume only errors in the encoding, uh, the 3% you have there on the right is 3% of physical qubits. Yes? Um, yes, well, okay. The 3% the here on the right is uh, when I when I don't want to model this microscopically, yes, but, but I write down a phenomenological mo noise model, namely that if say an error happens on a physical qubit, I I measure this stabilizer, and I don't care exactly how I do it, but I just mm -hmm. assume that whenever I measure it, I get the wrong outcome with the probability q. So you see, for instance, that here you have an error, but your stabilizer, you which should be minus one, tells you it's plus one. You overlook this. Exactly. Okay. This is kind of this phenomenological model. Okay. So I shouldn't think about it as the failure rate of qubits, but as the failure rate of your detection of the error. It's, it's in this model, it's both. Yeah, we assume it's both. Yeah, we okay. it's both. And again, for simplicity to have one number, we say it's at, of the same size, which is not necessarily the case. Okay. We say we have on physical qubits, uh, the blue ones here that form our code, we have bits and face flips. And we model also that we cannot perfectly measure the stable. Okay. So what worries me is that, is that if I understood correctly, the number of logical uh, qubits scales mm -hmm. like the square root of physical qubits yes. because it's number of rows and columns. So if you have a failure rate of physical qubits that is fixed, you, uh, as you scale up the system, you would eventually hit the threshold. Uh, of 3% or whatever percent. So yes. this whack-a-mole correction is kind of useless. No, 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 it's not useless. It's not? No, but what, what it means is that you have this threshold of 1% and it, it means that if the experimentalists say have an error rate of uh, half a percent, they are below the threshold. And that is the regime in which they, if they build a code, they will outperform the um, the storage time, say for, for, for uh, compared to single physical qubits, and in particular, the protection gets better and better if they make the system bigger. Oh, you, you can think of this. Uh, it's really the, the physics is uh, is related to the stability of uh, of um, like like in a ferromagnet. Imagine that you are below the Curie temperature. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, then you can have ferromagnetic order and, and it's stable. And, and the Curie temperature tells you, um, you know, I mean, the, the, the deeper you are kind of below that, the smaller you can make a system and have, let's say, um, robust magnetization, right? And then if you're only very close to the Curie temperature, then you have, start to having have, have more fluctuations. Okay, but I think I, I kind of get it. Okay, I, I would have to think a bit, but that's very useful. So my, my second part of the question, can I, can I make a, a follow-up? So yeah, yes, sure, sure. Okay, it's about this uh, the topological error correction where you choose the path so you avoid a, a defect, and you mentioned that this is uh, connected to to the percolating threshold mm -hmm. in a square lattice. Uh, but uh, as far as I understand, the percolate the percolation threshold of one half that you that you mentioned is uh, the threshold of defects in two D, so that you no longer can connect the left side to the right side. Say, yes, but. But for your uh, uh, topological error correction to work, you should be able to find a way from any specific point in the left side to another specific point in the right side. So that is more, more stringent than the percolation threshold. No, I, I don't uh, need this. The only thing I need is um, 
let's say here on the torus, I need just one string operator that winds around the, the this, this hole. Yeah. Okay, but then you would have one uh, logical qubit for that path. Okay, yes. But if you want n, because you have n uh, states in the edge, so you, you originally had n logical qubits. No, I originally had, sorry, I originally had, let's say, a large number of physical qubits, but uh, I went a bit quick on this. I, I have on the, in the surf, in the Tori code, I have two logical qubits. Yeah. This is, this is dependent oh. on, the, on the topology, it's independent of the number of physical qubits. I have just two logical qubits in a planar surface. Ah, this is, this is the I origin of, of my, of my um, uh, original question too. So here you have only one or two physical, uh, so two logical qubits encoded by all this bunch of, of, of physical qubits. Yes. Then it's clear. Okay. That is where, where the redundancy comes from. Yeah. So yeah, 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 yeah. If, if let's say here qubits are, are lost, yeah, then I can deviate this. And, and as long as there's kind of one starting point here. Right, right, right. So the... different columns in this surface code do not correspond to different logical qubits. No. They're the same. Okay. No, that's, that's right. So the number okay. of logical qubits uh, is a topological property that depends on the manifold in which I embed this. Yeah, I've okay. Shown here for a torus. Okay. And if you embed it in, in two torus with two holes, then you would have, for instance, twice as many logical qubits. Yeah. Then it's completely clear. Thank you. Thank you very much. In, in this same uh, transparency, so what is then, how many uh, physical qubits do you need to have for uh, a certain number of uh, logical ones? Is there a relationship that is fixed or? Um, yes. Well, it is, a, it is a scaling that is fixed. Mm -hmm. So let's say the, the, the smallest version of... Uh, this would be uh, with uh, actually 13 physical qubits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when one can, and, and what, what means smallest version is uh, means that you have a small lattice here, just such a corner, um, where you can uh, are at least guaranteed that you can ab you are able to correct one arbitrary error, bit, face flip, or, or both of them. And then, um, you know, you have, let's say, um, nine or 13 qubits. And then if you scale this up, you, um, that was the Google experiment I showed, then you get to 25. Mm -hmm. the next size would be like seven times uh, seven, 49. So it scales with the, with the, with the distance squared. So the, the size of the lattice or the length of the lattice uh, squared is, is how the number of physical qubits uh, scales. And in principle, the more uh, physical qubits you have, uh, you could have, the, the better protected your quantum computation is, no? That, that is right, exactly. As long as your physical error rates, depending on the noise model, are below the threshold. If you are above the threshold, yeah. then it does not help to have bigger systems, yeah? I see, I see. It's actually, it's actually worse, yeah? <laughs> so actually, that, so. <laughs> uh, but, but as soon as the experimentalists uh, uh, enter uh, the, with the noise uh, uh, rates, uh, values below the corresponding thresholds, then, uh, then, then it starts to become useful. And uh, what is also clear is the, the deeper they are below the threshold, the smaller uh, the systems uh, they, they need in order to have good protection. If they are just, just below the threshold, they have to have relatively large uh, systems. Yeah. I see, I see. But, but you're right. Growing <laughs> the system size is exactly the idea of how you make this more and more robust. And just a, a very perhaps a stupid uh, question, but here you have planar uh, codes, let's say, could you make them also three-dimensional, like, uh, yes. Uh, yes, with uh, the surface would be two-dimensional in that in that case, the, the boundaries, I mean, is yes. that also yeah. mm -hmm. use, could, could that be useful or or better in some way? It can be, it can be useful in a number of ways. Um, I've been uh, going here a bit uh, quick, but let me show you one. Or let me give you an idea. Let's at least we have here talked about one planar code. Imagine that you can have uh, several. Uh, you can stack several of these layers on top of each other. So exactly. That would be one way. So if you have a three D uh, lattice, that would be one way of how you can store, uh, for instance, a number of logical qubits, uh, like like in this uh, disks or patches on top of each other, and then you can even couple them um, in a, in a relatively simple way if you have this three uh, D architecture. One other um, approach, if you have 3D, is there are also quantum error correcting codes uh, that, that are intrinsically 3D. Yeah? So there's a version of 3D color mm -hmm. codes that have some computational advantages. Uh, for instance, they uh, allow um, 
uh, it's a bit technical, they allow for a T gate um, uh, in a, without magic state injection. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, and also, um, you know, uh, surface codes or, um, or uh, cluster states, yeah, would be, would be examples where you, where you would definitely benefit from a 3D architecture. Yeah. I see, very interesting. Yeah. So are there more questions in the audience? I don't see any more raised hands. Okay, yeah, I'm not, happy uh, to stay on for a bit longer if somebody wants to ask. Okay, very well, we can stay a little bit longer for those of you who want to discuss more particularly. So thank you very much, Marcus. It's been a wonderful, very interesting uh, talk. As Pablo said, uh, it's difficult, but very well explained. And, and now we, can, we will have it in YouTube so we can go uh, slowly through each uh, slide to really understand everything you said. So thank you very much, everybody. And we see you next.